Welcome to the Neja Chon podcast. Uh, this is Isaac. Uh, this week we're going to get into some stuff about raising the spine and dropping the chest. Uh, but first, Jess is going to tell a story about Bruce from his days at North Atlantic. And I talk a little bit about the retreats at Anvil Ranch that Bruce used to do. If you're listening to this when I release it, uh, I'll be doing a workshop this weekend on the Bagua single palm chain. So if you're interested, check out the website for details, www.watertradition.com, or you can find links in the description. Okay, that's all for now. I hope you enjoy the show, and uh, thanks for listening. So we've come through a couple of chapters here looking at the different uh, elements of opening the energy gates of your body. And I started to think back to when this book first came out because I know both of us were just getting into this stuff back then. And uh, at one point I ended up working for Bruce's publisher, North Atlantic Books in Berkeley. And uh, his, he published Opening the Energy Gates with that company and did really well. There weren't cell phones with your stuff on it so it was just it was a different world and when energy gates hit like america was ready for it like it it just seemed to hit at just the right moment and people were primed for it It became a bestseller and uh, years later i was in a sales meeting with uh you know representing north atlantic and we went to go talk about our latest books and i was in the meeting with some other some executives book selling executives and someone was like hey is that guy kumar francis you know doing a new book and he came over to talk to us about it and he said uh, he was telling us some stories about the, the early sales meeting for opening the energy gates. And the one that stood out was that, uh, you know, they had a bunch of like high powered people in there. And Kumar came in to give a talk about opening the energy gates and help the publisher sell the book. And somewhere in the demonstration, he ended up doing a flying, you know, high kick over some somebody's head who was one of the top salespeople leaving the crowd in a state of shock. And according to the story, it did barely clear the person's head by a very short amount of space. But uh, everyone was blown away as, you know, and he gave another great, you know, presentation on the book, I'm sure. Because he always makes a good impression when he comes in, into meetings like that. But uh, I just, it cracked me up because I could just picture him doing, you know, a flying kick and like wowing the crowd as part of the uh, sales pitch. But that was the times, you know, that was around 91, 92, back when, uh, you know, he was trying to get in the school going in Fairfax. When did he first get to Fairfax? Do you you know the day? 1990. Maybe 90. Somewhere around there. I think he started teaching 91. Uh-huh. So that's, uh, so he came from Santa Fe at that point, maybe? Yeah, so he left Santa Fe in 89 and then, you know. Took a couple of years before he got off the ground out here. Uh huh. And that's when the you know the post office box in Cascade got established. Right, and that's probably when he was writing the book, or you know the bulk of it it was during that period. Would be my guess too. Uh huh. Interesting. Just so when uh, and what year did you say you started joining up down there? So I started in ninety two. So ninety two. So he'd been teaching a couple of years at that point. I've been teaching about I think a year and a half publicly out here Mm. and how and uh so did you guys start did he were the retreats already ongoing out of anvil ranch because i came in 99 and it was already past anvil ranch so my first one was in 93 there you go yeah yeah so i think the first one was 91 oh yeah do you you know what that one was Uh, maybe tai chi instructor training or something yeah the very first one was a by invitation only kind of or pre-approval thing for Tai Chi, the short form. Mm, short woo form, okay. The second one was, that was the first time he taught like the spiraling stuff. So that was 92, and yeah, and then I went in 93. Ah. Uh, and so what, Anvil Ranch being some of the iconic classes he taught and, semina- and uh, sort of retreats that he taught, what... Could you describe the experience of going out to Anvil Ranch or what, for people who haven't been? So that was where Bruce taught his summer retreats. The schedule was basically he taught uh, martial arts during the weekly classes. He taught three weekend uh, 
No, in Fairfax, he taught yeah, martial like arts. Three, three, no, let's say, yeah. So, no, like the year-long schedule. So, like, for most of the year, it was weekly classes and three, like, every three months, he'd do a workshop. Mm, and then Weekend workshop. Yeah, and then in the summertime, he did a longer uh, thing at Amiel Ranch, and it was, like, usually in the beginning, it was one or two weeks, then he expanded it to, like, you know, a month or whatever, but... It was about 50 or 60 people, usually in the beginning. Later it was more. Um, you guys were all staying on site. Yeah, it was all, everyone stayed on site. It was a super remote place. You were, you know, about 45 minutes outside of Healdsburg. And so how far is that from San Francisco? It, it was on um, Skag Springs Road. It's on Skag Springs Road. Yeah. yeah. So, that, I mean, for people who don't know, that's the middle of nowhere. Middle of nowhere. Um, the, the closest place was Annapolis. Or, Gu- or Guadalajara. Guadalajara. Yeah. I mean, that's that's remote Northern California. Yeah. So, like, way the hell out there. So, we were stuck out there. The only other building you could see was a Buddhist temple that was all the way across the valley or whatever. And it was like, I think it was like an old horse ranch or some shit. It, it was a, you know, kind of old Sonoma style ranch house with a, um, like a second building next to it where the um, caretaker lived. I think that's where Bruce's room was. Mm. So it was two buildings, you know, essentially one for all the us to be in and then one for Bruce and the caretaker. Mm. So what was the daily training like back at uh, Anvil? 6.30 meditation. In the morning? Uh, yep. Uh, for an hour, hour and a half. 8 o'clock breakfast. Nine o'clock to twelve, twelve thirty was uh, the morning session. Lunch was twelve thirty or one till three or four. I mean, we take ridiculously long lunches, um, and then the evening sa- session was like three to five or four to six. Mm. So it was about five hours of class a day, and then afterward, I'd have dinner. And then Bruce would usually post up in the hot tub and, like, you could go in the hot tub and, like, ask him questions or whatever. And people would, like, push hands and, you know, fuck around on the lawn and stuff. So there was a lot more interacting with each other kind of after the class than I think there is now with people, you know, staying off site and stuff. Because mm. you're just stuck there in the group, so. So there's nowhere to go. You're kind of out in the woods. Yeah, you went way the fuck out in the woods. So there was some martial arts going back then? Is that where you got exposed to some of the martial arts? I think it was where a lot of people kind of mm, got to, like, play more. Mm. But, yeah, it was fun. It was a good time. Oh, is it water ready? All right, cappuccino time. Let's take a break. So moving forward with the opening the energy gates of your body book, um, we're back after cappuccinos. Um, very fine ones, I might add. <clears throat> so looking at the next section here, raise your spine and spread your shoulder blades. That's the concept of Hanshong Babe. So here he says, Babe refers to the raising of the spine. The lungs need to expand and open in order to breathe. In the raising of the spine, two things happen. The spine physically raises up, and then on the horizontal plane, the back becomes totally rounded. So this is, uh, you know, this speaks to what you spent a lot of time talking about in the last podcast about how the action of lifting the spine from above allows the shoulders to drop and round sort of of their own accord rather than in a forceful way. It all seems to center around that rising feeling. That's that ba bay, the spine rising. Uh, so they say lift the back. Start by rounding the shoulders and lift the back. Right, and I think the piece that gets misinterpreted is, is not lift the back from the top, it's lift the back. The spine starts at your butt, so your whole spine has to lift. Mm. So you can think of it in terms of like, if you just run your hand up your spine, or up someone's spine, it's that, that feeling of it. Starting length. at the sacrum and yeah, running and your hand up it? Lifting it from all the way from the bottom. Just like it's dropping all the way from the top. Sort of manually stretching someone's spine upward by yeah, I mean, pressing it, it a little like bit. Like you get the sense that there's I mean, there's an anchor at the bottom, which is the the butt, essentially the pelvis, and then there's the sense of everything coming out of that, the spine raising up out of that. 
Because um, that, that really, you know, this paragraph here speaks to that. The spine physically raises up as if it were being pulled upwards. Yeah. This takes the curve out of the upper back. Mm -hmm. The term ba in Chinese means to pluck something up, like pulling grass or a plant out of the ground. Okay. So that's that upward sensation that we've belabored quite a bit. But I, there's something about that that's so important because in standing, when I have didn't use that principle, I feel like I was sort of like pushing down on myself and crushing the joints below me. But when I get a feeling of that lifting, ba, he calls it, that takes the pressure off my joints and allows my back and my legs and especially my knees to feel right, sort I mean, of free. I, I think it's the essential issues that it, it discourages you from like punching down and like scrunching your body or compressing your joints. So, like you said, secondly, on the horizontal plane, the back becomes totally grounded. Um, the lungs expand backward toward the spine. So when, you, when you're straightening and then rounding at the same time, uh, it's allowing the chest to relax downward and the belly drop. Yeah, and that I, speaks to that sense of the chi dropping into the dantian. Yeah, and it's also, I mean, I think the big thing he's emphasizing there is just space. Like that nothing should feel compressed or you know, constricting. And so, you know, you should feel like when you breathe that like you have space inside your body for the, your lungs to move. So that's that feeling of space inside your body. Yeah, and for example, if your shoulder blades are super tight, you know, and there's no space between your shoulder blades, when you breathe into your upper back, nothing happens. It's so, constricted. Yeah, it's tight. It feels weird. It doesn't feel good. So by breathing into it, you can get a little bit of movement there to kind of at least wake it up a little bit. So like looking at, you know, overall relaxed standing, um, if someone... You know, what would be, if someone's standing in pretty good alignment, seems like they're getting that sense of lifting and relaxing, you know, what would you say a good thing to work on once you feel comfortable with the standing? How do you get in touch with the energetic side of it? What would be, you know, what would be one exercise or one little thing you could do to kind of trigger mm -hmm. that? Well, there's two two methods, right? One is you use breath. So you, you just use the following the breathing in and out to mm. kind of wake things, you know, to build your awareness of what's happening. So start feeling those nerves of the breath coming right. in and out through the lungs and the, the mouth. The one that's in the energy gates is more the scanning part that you just go from top to bottom and feel whatever you feel, you know, so you feel your forehead, you feel your nose, you feel your chin, you feel... So your... Differentiate the feelings of the different parts of your body. Right, it's the, you know... Um, Bruce has his little mantra about you know any sense of strength or tension or weakness or you know and and observing it. Yeah, and you're just you're just as he would say taking inventory of what's there. And so if um, if you don't have any sense of what's there, it's hard to different. You know, it's hard to tell if you are dissolving or not. So you start by getting your baseline, right? To getting your just, where are things? What do things feel like? Um, and then you, you have somewhere to, you know, something to judge what you're, you're you know, what you're doing off of. So on the, on the casual level, you'd start by saying, okay, just, I feel my head, I feel my face. I, maybe I don't feel, I don't know, my chin or something. Yeah, I mean, you can start with really simple things like just feeling the, the air on your skin or, you know, the clo your clothing touching your body. Like, if you just pay attention to that sort of very surface sensation of, you know, feel the air on your forehead, feel your nose, feel your lips, feel your chin, feel your throat, you're not going to, it's not, you know, dissolving or anything yet, but at least you're getting a sense of, it's like training wheels, you know, you're getting the, the basic motion of what you're going to be doing. Mm without the actual you know thing yet but but that allows you to like train your mind to um you know kind of get used to that pattern and to not jump around and stuff like that and your body starts to just have more sensation because if you just put your attention on something even if you don't dissolve it if you just sit there and feel it you'll start to notice things and so that's that's the 
ice to water part of it, right? So you, as you as you go from ice to water, you, you begin to feel what's happening, where where things are, what so things are. The feel the very act of feeling improves your ability to feel right. and also triggers a relaxation response in your actual physical body a little bit. Generally, yeah. Tends to. Unless you're wired kind of strange. Right, and everyone comes in different sizes and shapes. So obviously, you know, you apply this to your situation. I think what, as, what makes the fits. difference is your, is your um, you know, in psychology, they talk about your set and your setting, you know, the surroundings that you're in plus what your mindset is. And so some of it is what you're doing. Some of it is how you approach it. So if you approach it with like a really military kind of, I have to do this attitude, it's hard to relax. But if you take too much of a, you know, overly casual attitude to it, you generally don't have the structure. So mm -hmm. it's kind of like finding that middle ground where those two things are balanced. You know, that's what a lot of this stuff kind of hates towards is balance. Absolutely. That does seem to come up a lot in this. Um, so I just wanted to cover one more little section here in the standing dissolving, uh, standing posture section of the book. Um, and this one deals with the energetic side of things. So, so far we've looked at the, the plucking up of the spine and the rounding of the shoulders, relaxing the tailbone, lifting the top of the head. And now the book turns towards the more energetic side of things, um, what he calls the small heavenly orbit. And honestly, it's not quite energetic. It's more about the organs. What he says here, um, from the pelvis to the ribs, the internal oblique muscles should perform a lifting or raising action to prevent downward compression. So this muscular lifting is done simultaneously with the front of the body sinking downward so that the trunk of the body between the solar plexus and the hips, there is a sinking as well as a rising. Yep. The lifting of the spine and the dropping of the internal organs in chi together create the small heavenly orbit of energy, sometimes called the microcosmic orbit or small circulation. This is called Shao Jiu Tian in Chinese. Um, so this is a concept you find in a lot of different martial, Chinese martial arts, a lot of different Qigong uh, schools, meditation schools use this, mm -hmm. this same concept of the uh, heavenly orbit of energy. Here he's describing it in pretty physical terms. You lift your spine and then you allow your organs to sink, thereby creating a up the back, down the front physical sensation. Right. So, I mean, I, I think in, in Bruce's system, it's a secondary piece where dissolving is sort of the primary action, but you also mm. have this other thing going on, which is this, you know, this orbit business. Right. And that's it permanently going for everybody. That's right. But like, for example, Bruce's set marriage of heaven and earth is where he really works with that piece so it's it's more you know it's this is it's going on in energy gates but it's not the main you know thing i think here it's you have to have a concept of it you know on a minimal level because it allows you to maintain this particular alignment then it goes much further than that you know when you hit it and you get into something like heaven and earth so there's a there's kind of a surface level to it, mm. and then there's like a, you know, deep... Well, you might say that opening the energy gates introduces you to all the different material you're going to study in the subsequent sets, while at the same time being highly focused on a few key areas like alignments, dissolving, uh, I mean, and I don't the lower know if that was a function of the set containing it already, or Bruce wanted to get as much of that in the book, mm -hmm. you know, the, the trying yeah. to get a little bit of each piece. I mean, yes, it does exist in it, so, but, I mean, a little bit's right. good. But, you know, like I said, I mean, it's mostly it's about maintaining an alignment because if you, if you maintain the alignment, the orbit happens. If you're out of alignment, the orbit can, is impeded. So, you know, the, if you will, water method, as Bruce calls it, the, the approach there is not to try to force your, force yourself to do an orbit it's to relax until the orbit becomes oh you know wakes up or becomes clear to you becomes obvious and then just to sort of follow it and so on the most physical tangible level when you're standing there experiencing this uh standing qigong session the rising of the spine and then consciously relaxing the organs and guts 
creates a sense of dynamic lifting and falling on a physical level that then encourages your awareness of a maybe a deeper level as time goes on. Yeah, I mean, it's what I said before about I don't think there is a purely physical, right? There's a maybe a 99% physical, but it still has that 1% where something in terms of your you know, more subtle energies also has to be engaged. And so the piece about dropping, you know, from a non-physical sense is more about just relaxing but the feeling of you know dropping physically with these little alignments that's more of a you know physical thing and so you know again back to trying to like balance out these two seemingly opposing forces right because letting your body relax is a different thing than letting something move through you and here you're trying to do both of those. Mm. And so the, the the sensation of letting, if you will, your energy go through your body is a different feeling than letting your body relax. But moving your energy through your body will help you relax. And so, you know, the quote unquote purely physical thing is just fo focus on those alignments. Head mm. up, tailbone down, chest rounded, you know. Spine rising. You know, all that stuff. And then to just observe what happens to your more subtle layers as you do that. Because what you'll feel is you'll feel things pulling, you know, you feel muscles pulling on your neck when you tuck your chin, or you'll feel like tightness in your chest, or you'll feel, you know, collapsing in your midriff or whatever. So as those things begin to wake up, they're usually an indicator of one of these more subtle things being blocked right so if you're collapsing your midriff chances are there's something energetically blocked in that area like your liver or something and that it's going to be a kind of back and forth between giving the physical stuff space and giving the stuff on the inside attention you know and you know you're back to that feeling it makes it relax relaxing helps you move it you know, and it's just kind of this cycle, the cycle through, through those different pieces. So I think that's the, you know, energy gates as a whole, right? You cycle through going from a fairly non-physical thing to a fairly physical thing like the swings. And then you're back to a fairly non or, you know, minimal physical thing like the spine stretch. And so it kind of takes you through this whole range of yin to yang and back to yin and that you know that training of qigong just keeps going back and forth um, so we'll wrap up here by looking at the end of this section um, there are deeper more secretive and esoteric aspects of this practice however that must be learned under the strict guidance of a teacher to prevent bodily harm and that's what we, we would refer to as spiraling energy body or some energy practices are kept secret because to reveal them to a general audience would be like putting a gun in the hand of a child. Yeah. Many things are not taught in Qigong until a certain amount of experience or maturity is established in bit, the student. It's a bit condescending, but I think it's a good safety precaution. I mean, so when you look at his philosophy of teaching, you know, he says in this book, opening the energy gates was created as a way to give everyone a chance to experience this with the minimal chance of hurting themselves by doing anything extreme. There's four additional sets that go beyond that. Yeah. In my point of view, you know, it makes sense to learn the first one however you can. But then beyond that, it makes sense to learn from a, a quotes, qualified teacher. Because as he says, it's not so much that you're going to blow yourself up or whatever, but have feeling someone else do it physically with your hands on them and them, you know, showing you physically in person is really the only way you're going to learn the additional four sets. Yeah, and I think from a more practical sense that like just learning the movements doesn't actually give you what the essence of that thing is. And so you can learn energy gates from a book or a video, but you won't really get what dissolving is about because you don't feel it. You got to feel it somehow. And I think that, you know, the thousand years of doing this has shown that the only way to really get it is to do it with someone who already knows how to do it. Right, and even that doesn't necessarily guarantee it. No, it doesn't. Something like dissolving is a very personal experience. It starts off as a mantra, you say, and then over time it becomes something you feel 
that doesn't have a name anymore. Right. Um, and it's a feeling that you own. It's you. You feel yourself doing something. Nobody can explain that to you. So you have, again, the back and forth, the teacher's feedback, your own practice. If ultimately it's your own awareness. And I think Energy Gates is a great way to challenge yourself because he puts a lot of stuff in this book that to learn, a lot of precautions, but a lot of specifics on how to move your body. If you pay attention, you can figure it out pretty well. Um, beyond that is the spiraling energy body is the second set that traditionally follows it. And right, to me, half of- you know, that's what, as you said, that's what he's talking about where it says it ought to be taught in yeah. person. And that opens up the upward flows of energy in the body. And that does have, you know, carry with it some inherent risks. So it's not a good idea to just try to do that on your own. Mm. Um, but it's also, you know, um, it, it w- you wouldn't get much from doing it on your own anyway, so you're better off spending the time with something that you can actually achieve, I think, is the fair enough more practical approach. Do and it. as your practice builds up, then your capacity to train a, the rest of the material goes I, up as well. Yeah, and I think once, you're, once you can do all of it, the next level just kind of happens anyway. So the energy starts to rise on its own if you keep practicing, right. just and, to balance and, itself. And, and the openings and closings start to become uh-huh. apparent, and the bendings and stretching start to, you know, spiraling. Really. And, and you start to have like a, you know, a more organic development as opposed to okay, now it's time for me to do this piece. And you know, that's that's a way to teach it. You know, especially when you teach teaching lots of people because it keeps people from hurting themselves. Mm-hmm. But the reality is that this stuff isn't much more an art than a science and you know you have to kind of like approach it with a little bit of both so after a year or two of uh working diligently to open the energy gates there'd be no reason you couldn't just do spiraling energy body at that I did point spiraling, and continue it. i did spiraling i think less it was maybe a year but i think less uh-huh. and you know i didn't get much of it it was way over uh-huh. my, it was way over my head but um it set the stage for a lot of stuff mm. that when when things started happening, I wasn't freaked out by it or, you know, I knew I knew what was going on. So it was like, all right, this is less of jolting. I mean, would you say that's a characteristic of, of this system in the sense that there's pieces along the way of each set that connect to the other sets? Absolutely. So there's there's these threads that run through it that well, carry on. Yeah, I mean, I think that's the 16 part in gong is, you know, Mm. The the sets are just containers. The sixteen part gong is a continuum, right? Okay. So you have, you know, a little bit of heaven and earth and energy gates, a little bit of you know, gods in heaven and earth, and it's you know they're all loosely you know they're, they're, they share elements, but you know they all have their specialty, if you will. They're, they're you know, think of it sort of like flavors. Mm. You can mix and match the flavors, or you can have them one at a time. And there's no real right or wrong. It's just sort of what you're trying to achieve, you know. So the right tools for the job. Yeah, and and what your, you know, what your shortcomings are when you start will often determine which ones you're going to spend more time on. Makes sense. It's interesting you mentioned because the 16 day gung didn't appear in the original opening the energy gates of your body. It's not in the back? Nope. It didn't come to it. That's why Power of Internal Martial Arts huh. to me was so mind blowing when I first saw it because I hadn't realized. You sure about that? But, uh, yeah. I know there was, a, there was an article um, shortly before the energy gates book came out where he listed 10. Uh huh. Yeah, I remember so, that. There's yeah. old articles. So that. But we'll get to the 16-part Nagong at some point in the near future. Yeah, it's Great talking with you, bro. All right. Cheers. Talk to you again. Uh, hey, this is Isaac again. Uh, just a couple things. Um, we've been getting some questions from people uh, writing in. So we're probably going to start a Patreon so people can join that. And then uh, we'll answer questions from the members. Um, also, like and subscribe us on iTunes or wherever you're listening. Thanks. Bye.